following recording is a production of WUTZ 88.3 FM on the farm in Summertown, Tennessee. Welcome to The Mystic and the Skeptic, the show that asks the tough questions and explores different alternatives to today's pressing issues, theories, or enigmas. A podcast devoted to the exploration of all things mystical, philosophical, scientific, political, conspiratorial, and cosmic. Join us in an exploration of the mystic skeptic mind space. On today's show, we will discuss the ancient astronaut craze. Our guest is Dr. Michael Heiser. He has a PhD from the Department of Hebrew and Semitic Studies from the University of Wisconsin Madison. He also earned an MA in Ancient History from the University of Pennsylvania, with his major fields of study being Ancient Israel and Egyptology. He earned another MA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in Hebrew Studies, and he attended Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Heiser is featured on the Debunking Ancient Aliens documentary, which can be found on YouTube. As we start our discussion, we need to lay a foundation for our audience about what we're talking about. One of the reasons we started this show is to shed light into the world of conspiracy theories and what makes this, these claims problematic. In 1968, Eric von Daniken wrote Chariots of the Gods, and then in 1976, Zechariah Sitchin wrote the book The Twelfth Planet. Dr. Heiser, who are these guys, and what are their credentials, and how do they reach these conclusions? Let's start with von Daniken. I mean, uh, von Daniken is not, well, let's just, how do I want to, how, how can I sort of be nice here? Um Von Daniken has a very checkered history, a very checkered ethical history. He, I believe, was a journalist or something like that. I mean, he, or no, maybe he was, Sitchin was a bit of a journalist. I don't know. Von Daniken, I think, dabbled in that, but, he, you know, just some normal, you know, kind of feel. They're nothing academic. Neither of them have any academic credentials. I don't think Sitchin has had the checkered history that Von Daniken has. It's actually really hard to uh, to find, you know, any sort of data, any sort of CV, any sort of resume for Sitchin, anything that would validate what, I think initially it wasn't his claim, I think it was his publisher's claim and his followers' claim, claims about him being an ancient languages expert. There, there, there's nothing to support that. Uh, you know, I know he was Jewish, so I, I, I guess that he spoke Hebrew, but he, he makes just like first semester Hebrew mistakes in his book, so I don't know what to think. You know, but I, I can say with a high degree of confidence that there's no sort of paper trail that would lend that would give either of them any credentials. But if, if listeners want to list, learn a little bit about Von Daniken, they should go up to Jason Colavito's blog. That's C O L A V I T O. Um, he's he's done a number of fairly lengthy biographical sketches of Von Daniken, and it it's not pretty. Let's put it that way. But I don't think Sitchin suffers from Von Daniken's ethical uh, issues and, and perhaps even criminal issues. Uh, Sitchin, I think, is, is much cleaner than that. But there, there's no reason to believe that either of them have any credentials for doing the sorts of evaluations of archaeology or texts that they do in their books or on TV. What's the name of the, the young man or the gentleman who does the debunking Ancient Aliens website? Yeah, that, that's Chris White. Um, I often get, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I often get emails about, oh, this, this documentary you, you made was great. Well, I, I didn't make the documentary. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in the last third. Uh, it's the work of, of Chris White who, you know, the video began as a hobby for him. And he doesn't have... Uh, doesn't have a lot of money. It's not like History Channel kind of equipment and quality, but I thought he did a really good job, you know, on on his his documentary. Tell us about your contention about Sitchin's view of the Anunnaki. Then he writes something about a princely alien blood given to human beings, and that humans come from the sky, and that the Sumerians knew about undiscovered planets in some of his books. Yeah, I mean, he, Sitchin writes lots of things that, you know, th there there are some things that are either, you know, that would there are basically two categories. One category is he will sort of misread a text, and what I mean by that is 
is that he he doesn't do any of his own translation unless he's he's fabricating material. That's the second category, but we'll we'll get into that in a minute. He'll he'll use like Samuel Noah Kramer's translations or the translations from J. B. Pritchard's volume Ancient Near Eastern Text. I mean, you you can find a, a lot of what he's presenting in the book, and um, they're they're normative translations. But what he'll do is he'll impose a 21st century science fiction technological reading on these ancient texts. He'll just impose it. Um, you know, there, there actually isn't a single text from, from the ancient world that have the gods traveling from one planet to Earth. There, there's actually zero of that. You do get flying craft, like up in the sky, you know, but you never get sort of interplanetary travel, which is a significant omission for the whole ancient astronaut theory. But Sitchin will just, he'll just sort of make stuff up like that, or he'll impose in this worldview. My, my bigger beef with Sitchin, and, and people don't seem to understand this, and I, I, I think there are reasons for that because, you know, most people don't care about, you know, ancient texts. They don't spend their time there. My, my beef with Sitchin is not that his translations are wrong or that he, you know, over-literalizes things or imposes different contexts. That's actually, none of that's actually my big beef with the Anunnaki th stuff. My criticism is that, the, that what he says literally, literally does not exist in the tablets. So I'm not quibbling with him over a translation. I'm saying... This thought that you have that you attribute to cuneiform tablet, whatever, or any cuneiform tablet, literally is not there. And to prove this, what I did was I created a screen capture video that I posted on uh, my website, SitchinIsWrong.com. And it, it's a boring video, I'll admit it, but it's useful. I go up to the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature, it's an online site. And I show people on the screen, here's what you do. You, here's what you type in to search for the term for Anunnaki in all of the Sumerian tablets. And then you hit the button, you get the results, and then it, it's all in transliterated cuneiform. But I said, if you just look at the little TR next to each line, click that and you get a translation. And so my challenge is to Sitchinites, do the search. Don't, do, don't say that Mike said this and I believe it or not. Do the search. Get the results yourself. Read through all. There's, there was like 118, 120, whatever it was the last time I, I looked or did the video. You know, read the results. You will not find the Anunnaki associated with Nibiru. You will not find the Anunnaki coming from another planet. You will not find... You know, and any connection at all, you know, with these ideas, you, you, you just won't find the major extraterrestrial mythology claims about the Anunnaki. They literally are not there. They are fabrications. Now, you know, to, to me, you, you just don't do that to people. You don't lie to them. Um. So people sort of misunderstand. They think that, that, oh, well, Sitchin's translations are just as good as anybody else's. Well, first of all, he's using in-print translation. They're, they're not his own. And second, you can't argue about the translation of something that isn't there. That's the major disconnect. So what would you say to people that um, think that beliefs are subjective and based on our own personal interpretation of the universe, including the supernatural, intelligent life and other planets? How can someone discern truth one way or another? Well, you, you actually mix two thoughts in that question, and they're both important. Uh, you ended with discern truth, and then you, you began with uh, about beliefs being subjective. A lot of beliefs are subjective, but they shouldn't be. Uh, beliefs should be based on data. They should, they should be rational. There, there, no one is served well by having an irrational belief. And so, again, I don't, I don't view these things as mutually exclusive. I view them as sort of two tracks toward the same destination. And so to discern uh, whether one belief is better than another, to me, that's a question of, of really two things. Again, two buckets. There are some things that you can test, you know, that, that, are, that are falsifiable through 
physical scientific testing, you know, repeated testing. We all know the scientific method, or at least I hope we would. So there, there are ways to winnow certain beliefs, you know, out of the picture uh, when you're doing that. And the second bucket is is rational coherence. And I like to illustrate the difference between the, the first bucket is the rules of science. The second bucket is sort of like uh, legal evidence, like in a court of law. What, what the goal of, of, of a court of law should be, and I, and I hope still is for the most part in, in our culture today, is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to make any other conclusion less likely or less probable when we have this beyond a shadow of the doubt standard. That's actually what you're trying to do. I'm, I'm arguing for a belief, for a conclusion, for a verdict in the legal metaphor. And, and to do that, I need to demonstrate through logical argumentation, uh, analysis of evidence, uh, you know, just sort of coherence, you know, logical coherence. I need to demonstrate that for you to conclude anything else is less rational. So that, that is my approach to beliefs. Beliefs should be rational and, and they should be approachable and at least testable in, you know, from both buckets, science and then logical coherence. Some things are not reproducible in the scientific you know, world, like is there a God or not? Well, that's something you have to approach from the perspective of which, which answer is more or less coherent than another one. Okay, and that's that's where you would put truth, like something that can be uh, discerned through these. We are we, right. We, we we are not omniscient, and so the the standard for truth should not be omniscience, because then nothing could be true. Not only wouldn't wouldn't anything be true, nothing could be true. Because we are not omniscient, and, and and some you know critics and atheists seem to think they're being clever by insisting that if I can't know something perfectly, then I can't know it at all. That's just bunk. Okay, you can't know anything perfectly. So you know, unless you're you're willing to to live in the in the theater of the bizarre, where I don't really. You know, I try to live as though nothing is real and nothing you know can be can be believed or embraced. You know, go ahead and, and go off and live in La La Land. You know, uh, ultimately you're going to be a hypocrite because no one can actually live that way. You know, you'd either have to be institutionalized or maybe you'd commit suicide or something. Okay, then then you can then I guess you can do it. But in in the real world, okay, where where the 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 normal world of of intelligent human life, okay. Nobody lives this way. So the, the, the standard, I think, need, needs to be, again, trying to decide what do I think is the most rational or the most coherent. And, and there's, there's, there's a bit of a danger you know, with this because I'm assuming that people will care and they will actually try to test ideas. Some atheist friends that I have I mean, they're they're in the process of doing that. They they really try to make it a discipline, and you know, in many cases, you know, the they are where they're they are because of some experience, and it's usually I'm usually on their side of the experience. You know, something terrible was done to them, or somebody else, or whatever. I get that. That's again, that that's a that's a very human response. But a lot of a lot of the the sort of militant atheists that that you know I run into or I read, they ha they're lazy. They have not taken the time to, to really go into a question and test it, test their own answer. What they want is they want the answer that they like and so that they can ridicule something else. That's just laziness. And, and Christians do the same thing. You know, people of faith do the same thing. Uh, I think it's equally as dishonest for them to not test their own ideas. But, but the goal, again, to get back to the original question... The, the goal is I, I want what I believe to be rational at least, even though I, I, maybe I can't reproduce it. You know, not all things conform to scientific testing, but they do conform to coherence testing, to logic testing. And so we need to do our best to, to test those things and see you know, if, if they hold up, hold up under scrutiny. And, and our standard should be let's just try to do a really, really good job about that. Let's be sincere about it and do the best we can. But if, if the standard is omniscient, 
omniscience. Well, then, then nothing is true and nothing can be true. There's no, you can't even discover it because you're not omniscient. In season eight of the popular ancient alien show, they talk about the Ark of the Covenant. They make the outrageous claim that a nuclear attack is depicted in the Bible. They also quote the Raiders of the Lost Ark, which claims the Ark would level cities. Both of these claims are not part of the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament, from what I can tell. Um, You're correct. They're not. Uh, where would they even get the idea that uh, a nuclear bomb would be uh, detonated somewhere in ancient Israel? Well, I, yeah, I, I think what, what you see happening there is, is a, it, it's really sort of a two-pronged approach. They will adopt the the myth of nuclear warfare, like in ancient India, and the ancient aliens debunked documentary uh, does a really good job on that segment, showing again just the the scientific and frankly in this case and logical incoherence of the idea. But but they won't they won't look at at the data, or they'll just take an idea and then they'll marry it over here to the Hebrew Bible because. The Ark was associated with, with death in, in certain scenes. Uh, there's Uzzah who touches the Ark and dies, you know, and then there's the warning about, you know, don't, you know, penetrate the, inner, the veil of the inner holy of holies lest you die. So they'll, they'll, they'll take an association of the Ark with the death of, of one or two people, um, and then they'll marry it to this nuclear fantasy, and there you go. I mean, and it makes for kind of a cool movie. But you're you're right. There, I remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I, you know, frankly, I love the movie. But that one picture they show, you know, when they when they recruit Doctor Jones about this death ray coming you know, being emitted from the ark, there isn't a single passage like that in the Bible. It it it's literally just made up. It's contrived. But it, it's sexy. Makes for a good movie. You know, you can cue the spooky music at that point. Um, you know. It, it, it's Hollywood, you know. What what can you say? And Ancient Aliens is is ultimately about money. It, it's about viewership and and, and selling uh, selling advertising for for those people who are interested. Is this is kind of really good timing that you would ask that particular question? Uh, yesterday, I, I discovered that an old post, an old page uh, from my sort of original website way back, you know, at that in the year 2001 is when I first went online, but this post is from 2003. I, I found that it didn't live on my new site anywhere. It was like orphaned. And so I reposted it yesterday. And it's a description of, of my experience, my only experience working with the, uh, the history channel uh, and being censored, you know, out of, out of one of their programs. But I have been asked four times now to be on the ancient alien show. And my reply is always the same. Hey, I'd love to be on your show. But can you promise me in writing you won't do this to me? And then I send them that link. Um, you know, but now it lives on my blog so people can find it you know, more easily. It was, it was just orphan. But it's all, about, it's all about views, getting views, getting an audience so that you can sell advertising money. It's not about a real search for truth. And, and I know that firsthand. So what does it mean they censor you? Did they just cut clips of what you said and, and reshuffle them? Or? All right, here – well. Here, here's what how I'll give you the, the mini version of the story. So back in 2003, I get you know a phone call. It was from Weller Grossman Studios. Now what the History Channel does is they they hire studios to to film for them, and then you know either it's something they commissioned or something that that the, the film company can shop to the History Channel. In this case, it was commissioned because the original email said. You know we would like you to be in 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 a show called UFOs and the Bible. So I, you know, I'm, I'm naive. It's like, I've never done TV. Oh, sure. That sounds like fun. I get a trip to Los Angeles. Why not? You know? So I, a couple days before I'm supposed to go, I get another email with a list of questions they're going to ask me in the interview. And they're all very leading questions. Very easy for me to, to see what kind of answers they want for the show. So I, I called them up. I said, look, you know, I'm sorry if you, if you spent the money for the plane ticket already, but I'm I'm literally not going to give you anything that you're going to want to hear. Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to answer these questions the way you want them answered. Uh, and they're like, oh, no problem. You know, we want all views, all that. Come on out. So I did. Did the interview, two hours worth, and then you have to sign a release form. And they said, they said okay, a year from now, this is going to appear. Then we'll send you an email and you can watch the show. Okay. 
Well, I had friends who were also interviewed for this that were a little smarter than I was. One of them insisted that he audio tape his interview and they let him do it, which kind of surprises me now in hindsight, but they let him audio tape it. And what he did was he took the audio tape, had it transcribed and sat on it. And then when the show aired, he recorded that audio, had that transcribed, and then he put them up side by side on his blog. And you can see where they took a few words of one sentence and spliced it to a few words of another sentence, like three lines later. They also did it to, to other, other people that, again, had no defense. They couldn't show that they had done this, but, but you know, they, they came out saying things they didn't believe. In my case, I must have done such a great job of not giving them anything they could you know, cheat on that I was deleted entirely from the show. And it was, a, it was a good thing for me because when the show aired, the title had changed. So instead of UFOs and the Bible, now it was UFOs in the Bible. So they not only sort of lied to me up front about the title, but I was completely censored, you know, my, my views, my answers to, to two hours worth of questions never showed up in the entire show. So again, I don't want to hear from anybody doing ancient alien stuff about how we're seeking truth. That's just garbage. Okay, well, that leads to the next question. Um, you know, I I reviewed um, Chris White's um, website, and he talks um, many times about the connection between the ancient astronaut speculators uh, and the New Age movement, the occult, and the Theosophic Society. Do you make the same links, or is that also a, a kind of conspiracy theory on itself? There, there's a lot to that. Although I wouldn't say it's a it's a complete overlap. Um, you know, people people buy into ancient astronaut stuff for several reasons. It's not only just one. But what you can say, and again, uh, Jason Colavito has a great book on this. Um, it's it's about uh, again his last name is C O L A V I T O. But he shows that you can find all of the threads. The, the name of his book is The Cult of Alien Gods. You can, you can find all the major threads of the ancient astronaut theory in 19th century horror literature like H.P. Lovecraft, you know, The Mountains of Madness, that kind of thing. Um, in, in 19th century fiction, horror literature, and theosophy, uh, Carl Vito also has a book on... Uh, Ancient, ancient astronauts in theosophical literature. Uh, there, there's actually a lot to that, but, but the sort of the classic on this is The Morning of the Magicians, uh, which is, I th boy, I, I can't remember what the copyright is, maybe seven, 1970, maybe even a little earlier, but maybe the 70s. But again, this is sort of ferreting out, or, or not, it, it's not a debunking book, it's just, you read that, and again, a, a popular explanation of this this literature and the ideas in circulation in the 19th, early, early 20th century. And it's very easy to see the major plot elements, if you will, of the ancient astronaut uh, thesis. You, you get a condensed version of that in Jocelyn Godwin's book, Psych or Atlantis and Cycles of Time. He has a chapter on uh, UFO stuff. Uh, and and the, the Atlantis mythology is right out of the theosophical literature. So there is a lot to that, but I wouldn't want to exclude other reasons why people either prefer uh, that worldview uh, or or hate another worldview, and then they just sort of wind up in this camp. There, there are other reasons for it besides occult literature. What about just um, media attention and selling books? Yeah, I think that's one of them. I mean, I... Sometimes I think people, uh, you know, also adopt the view because they don't like Darwinism, and and for them, the the major competitor to Darwinism, of course, has been you know creationism, and that's usually f flavored you know with certain uh, certain kinds of, of of Christianity, maybe like literal twenty four hour day creationism, but maybe they don't like creationism at all, so they don't like Darwin. They don't, they don't like the alternative, you know, we have to believe in a God that created us and now I have to assign validity to the Bible. They don't want to go there. So what's left for them? Well, the, the, the middle position, the, the, the new competing position is outside intervention 
of an extraterrestrial nature. And so a lot of people prefer it for that reason, you know, or, or that sort of thought process. And it has nothing to do with occult literature or even, I mean, if you're, if you're a producer of this kind of content, yeah, you know, you, you want to make money, you want to be popular, you know, that kind of thing. You want to make, make your living, although almost no one can, on the lecture circuit, you know, of this kind of stuff. So that what you mentioned is true. Um, but for others, it's it's sort of a process of elimination. I don't like the two major uh, approaches to human origins, so I'm going to go here, you know, with ancient astronauts. Okay, so uh, we've been very critical of the ancient a- astronaut theorists. Um, the reason that our show is called The Mystic and the Skeptic is because um, we like to give people a chance to, to share their ideas and kind of hold them to scrutiny. But we also like to, um, you know, question everybody, even the people who uh, are critical of other things. So what would you say to people could turn it around and say that any type of religious based uh, or faith based alternative can also be criticized and held to scrutiny, especially as if ancient civilizations were obsessed with beings coming from the sky to share revelations with them, you know, angels, deities, or, or God. If, if that can be a possible explanation, why can't it be the explanation of people from other planets with more advanced civilizations doing the same thing? It, it would depend on how the question is framed. If, if the question is sort of ultimate origins, like our universe or you know, our solar system or something like that, um, that, then I think it has a, a serious coherence uh, scientific problem as well because I don't think created beings could produce those things. Um, if it's smaller than that, let's just say it's life on Earth, you know, the, whole, the old panspermia thing. Well, then, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes more workable, you know, to, to argue for, you know, an extraterrestrial origin. Of course, there are some fundamental problems and fundamental obstacles to that. Uh, to, to have that be a meaningful discussion, you have to know first that there actually are extraterrestrials. And that's different than is there a God in, in, in some fundamental ways, because extraterrestrials are the way they're talked about and the way they're imagined and the way they're, they're hypothesized. Is An extraterrestrial is a material life form. And in and of itself, it would be the, you know, again, going with the standard panspermia view here, it would be the product of evolution and so on and so forth. So uh, we ought to be able, at least in theory, to find one or, or, or test scientifically the, the possibility that there could be one. And, and people are trying to do that now. With, with God, you can't really do any of that because God is for cast that way no matter what you know, the religion is. He's non-material. Uh, it, it's a non-created thing. I mean, it, it, they're, they're two different categories, so you can't really approach them the same way, um, you know, despite the fact that they both become part of this discussion, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if you're going, it, another way to frame the question, if you're going about, or if you're going with what, like, religious texts say, Let's say you're going to assign meaning or or assign uh, validity to what a religious text says, and then you're going to ask the question, well, maybe they're not angels, maybe they're aliens. Well, then my my first question would be be is, well, how how are the angels, how are the beings in this religious story cast? Do we, have, do we have a statement that they're from another planet? I mean, oh, they're, they're from the heavens. Well, we know why that's said, because that, well, the humans don't live up there. The gods live up there. Where else would you look for something that's non-human? Okay, we, we get that, but that doesn't answer the question of, you know, are they truly extraterrestrial? Well, maybe they didn't tell the humans that. Well, why not? They tell them all this other stuff. I mean, in ancient astronaut lore, they, they tell humans all sorts of things about themselves. But if you're going to say that this is coming from a text, I'd like to actually see it in a text. I, I mentioned uh, earlier that there, there are no texts that have the gods coming from one planet to Earth. There are lots of texts that have, like, flying craft, you know, zipping around here or there or whatever, or at least what people can say are flying craft. I mean, that you don't really have that. You know, you have the Vimana is probably the best example of that. But, you know, again, are they even flight worthy? Well, you know, no, but does that matter? I mean, you have all these sort of sub-questions. But if, you, if you're just going with what the texts say, an extraterrestrial 
at least again as the way we we approach it rationally and scientifically, has a determinate lifespan, has a physical existence that needs to be maintained through, we assume, eating or drinking something, nutrition and hydration. It has to reproduce. You know, the species has to reproduce. None of those things are characteristic of, for instance, the way angels are depicted either in the Quran or the Bible or anything like that. So you have some disconnects. But it just depends how the question is framed. If if you take the details out of it and you just – and again, I wouldn't want to do that because then you just create outliers. You then, then you skip material, and I think that's cheating. But let's just say if, if you take all the details out of it and you say – you cast it like this. You know, well, your religious texts have a, quote, superior intelligence, unquote, creating humans. Why couldn't that superior intelligence be an alien? Well, you know, again, if you leave all the details out, that that's a discussion that has some interchangeability. But once you start drilling down into it and all these things sort of pop up that create disconnects, points of, of discontinuity between, you know, angels and, and God or gods and and uh, what we think of as extraterrestrials, well, then, then you start, it starts to unravel a little bit, actually in, in some significant ways. There's something that's always bothered me when they say that extraterrestrials gave secret knowledge to different civilizations, is, you know, there are all these structures, Stonehenge or Native American pyramids, that they, they all had some alien influence. Doesn't that take away from human achievement? Abs- absolutely. <laughs> when it's all said and done, is there anything out of this world about any of those buildings that, that you can discern? Not in their not in their construction. I mean, I, you know, if, if out of this world, if you're including archaeo astronomy, well, then yeah. I mean, because a lot of these things are deliberate alignments, deliberate imitations of things you'll see in the heavens, patterns, constellations, and whatnot. But again, all you need for that is naked eye observation and a plan, and of course, enough labor. Uh, to do it, but I, I I agree with you. You know, to to me, it, it's a, it's almost offensive that we have to bring in aliens here because ancient people were just too stupid. It's a very condescending position, and in some instances, and we'll bring von Daniken back here. It's a very racist position. Um, von Daniken's thinking, and again, I don't want to lump Sitchin into this. You know, as much as I think Sitchin is wrong. I'm not going to put him in this same category, but Von Daniken has used a lot of his ancient astronaut stuff to promote the idea of the inferiority of certain races. Uh, so I think it's offensive on that level as well. Um, but we know we, ancient Egypt, for example, there are pictures showing you how they, they move blocks. There, you know, there are texts, you know, that, you know, show how things were plotted out and measured. You know, it, it it's not, you know, I have things on my blog about how simple applied physics, if you just have enough manpower, you can do these things. Uh, you can build megalithic structures. For, for your listeners who are interested in this, I, I used, to, used to teach at the local university. I taught it two or three times, an Egyptology course. And I'd walk in the first day and I'd say, look, let's be honest. You know, you, this is an elective class. You know, you, I know you like ancient Egypt, but at the end of the day, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to remember a lot of this three, four, five years from now. But you need to be here on this day, and I would give it to him on the calendar, because what I will show you on this day, you will never forget. And what I would do is that I would show them Wally Wallington's video. Wally Wallington is the, is the retired contractor from Flint, Michigan. His website is theforgottentechnology.com. You can only see a, a minute or two of what Wally does on the website and on YouTube, but it is the best $15 for his CD of home video that you will ever spend. Wally Wallington builds a miniature Stonehenge in his backyard by himself, and he doesn't use the wheel. He uses applied physics because he's really good at it, leverage and counterweight. He, he, he pours a 25,000-pound block. He devises a method for spinning it, to a different location and erecting it. When you see it, you will the, the first thought that pops in your head is this is so obvious now that I'm looking at it, why didn't this occur to me before? And the reason is 
is because we use our technology to solve different problems and do different things than the ancients did. And we're at the point now where we, we have other methods to do these sorts of things. They didn't. They were masters of applied physics. And it, it, it is the most remarkable thing you will ever see in your life. And it's funny, too. You know, he changes shirts five or six times. He's got you know, his rear end crack sticking out of his pants, you know, the typical contractor thing. But there he goes. He, he, he builds what he calls his Wallington lever. He builds a, a large-scale version of it. And I'm not kidding you. It's going to sound bizarre. But he uses this lever and counterweight to spin his garage across his yard. And he does it to show that it scales. The method scales. It, and that's, I mean, he, he shows how the Egyptians could arrive at, at the Pythagorean theorem without knowing it. You know, and, and how they would apply the math, you know, to different angles, to move different... It, 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 it is the best $15 anyone can ever spend. I mean, I don't get a cut from Wally. I'm just telling you what I, essentially what I, I, I would tell my students. You will remember this video the rest of your life. Because I don't want anybody leaving my class saying aliens built the pyramids. They didn't. People can do this. They were really, really smart. There's a lot of different ways to debunk the ancient alien theorists or the show. But there's no reason to, to go into you know the possibility of white supremacist ideas or anything like that. Can it be just done through the inaccuracies of the show? Because I, I think that in the Ancient Aliens debunk sh uh, documentary, he does a good job doing that. Yeah, he, he does. Do you think that's enough to, to be able to create an alternative uh, perspective on what they're doing without having to go into, you know, they look down on other cultures or they think the aliens did everything. There's no true geniuses in the world. They're all ha half alien people and star children. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You know, I, 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 think, I think what Chris does in the documentary is, is adequate for that because, I mean, once you see, you know, one, once you see what the producers of the show, Ancient Aliens, are not telling you, I mean, in other words, how they, how they filter the information that they put into the show so that it's slanted one way or they deliberately omit things that would contradict what they're saying. Once you actually see what they do to their viewers, I think that would have a, a, a high value in getting people to very quickly realize, you know, we've basically been had that they're not being honest. Okay. I don't know if it was Colobito or, or Mr. White that mentioned there was an episode of ancient aliens where, they pretty much went Gnostic and they started talking about how uh, either the God of the Bible or the traditional God was considered uh, an alien or like a foreign alien that needed to be destroyed. And there's another alien that is trying to preach truth to the, to the world. Uh, are you familiar with this? Yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the Archon invasion theory. It goes by different names. It, it, you know, it, it's basically Gnosticism warmed over for a 21st century sci-fi audience. Um, again, ancient ancient aliens. Now, I, I don't want to say that all people who buy into ancient astronaut theory are really swallowing Gnosticism. This is just one sort of tale that's told uh, underneath the ancient astronaut umbrella. The, the guy who sort of popularized this was John Lamb Lash. Uh, he's kind of known for it. You'll also um, try to remember the guy's Secret Sun blog. Um, I can't remember the the guy who writes that. Um, he's he's into Chris, is it Christopher Nolan? Um, the guy who wrote Our Gods Wear Spandex. Christopher Knowles, excuse me, I think is the guy who writes the Secret Sun blog. But he uh, he articulates this trajectory. I'm not saying that he's a he's a believer in it. Lash is a believer. Uh, in it, but I don't know that Knowles is. But I mean, you'll you'll see this. It's a, it's sort of a one of the popular trajectories or versions uh, of ancient uh, astronaut mythology. Just just retelling the Gnostic story, or the the Sethian Gnostic story, uh, to be more particular in you know in 21st century technological terms. 
I find that it's still very, um, you know, the, the original Gnostics or the whatever the mystery religions who took, uh, you know, this kind of twisted form of Christianity. I find that still very anti-Semitic in the sense of blaming the Israelites or the God of the Israelites for the chaos of the world and then trying to turn it around and, you know, there's a new deity that is bringing in something else. I feel that uh, Nietzsche and other guys kind of took some ideas from that. Well, they, they did. They, they did. I mean, I think you're spot on there. I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of this kind of content in, in my novel. My, I, wrote, I have two novels. One is The Facade, and its sequel is The Portent. And in The Portent, I spend a lot of time on pretty much exactly what you described. Now, if you go back and you think about your, your Gnosticism question, that there's a good alien out there trying to combat the bad alien, you well, yeah, the good alien turns out to be the Logos, who, of course, is equated with Jesus. And, and you're right, there is this anti-Semitic sub, subtext uh, to this because the Demiurge, you know, the, the, the creator, the maker in Gnosticism is the God of the Bible. And, of course, that's the God of the Jew. So they're, they're the bad guys. And then that, that means we have to come up, we have to articulate and argue that, that the Logos, Jesus, was not Jewish. And so that, that you know, factors into Aryan racial mythology. Uh, so, and that takes you into a little bit of theosophy, but Ariosophy. Uh, and again, that, that bleeds into, you know, Aryan racial theory, which bleeds into the, the whole Nazi occult, you know, sort of articulation of race. Uh, there, there's just a huge pool of ideas, you know, that all of this stuff... You know, it created something in the late 19th century, early 20th century that we call Aryan racial theory, you know, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic beliefs that, that of course, we know from from Nazi history. In our day and age, you know, we'll we'll just put the neo-Nazi thing off to the side for a moment. In our day and age, you know, we we now get ancient astronaut theory, but it, it, it still has, some versions of it still have this subtext of, of, you know, making Jesus the white hat and the Jew the black the black hat. You you do get that, you know, in, in different streams of it. But I don't want to I don't want to portray all ancient astronaut theorists as anti semites. That that you know goes way too far. But but that version does exist uh, and is articulated today. Do you know much about um, you know? There's a show on ancient aliens, or I guess uh, searching for ancient aliens that talks about the the Nazis and time travel, and then there's that ridiculous movie, Iron Sky, where the Nazis go to the moon and they have spaceships. Is there anything, any claim that they make with the Nazis and aliens, like in Star Trek, like you know of? If, if your listeners are familiar with um, Nicholas Goodrich Clark, uh, there are a number of, of books on Nazi occultism. Goodrich Clark wrote one called The Occult Roots of Nazism. It's a scholarly book. It was his dissertation, I believe, at Oxford. Uh, it, but it, it's published. But he followed that by Hitler's Priestess, and then his third volume is called Black Sun. In the third volume, in Black Sun, there's a chapter that discusses Himmler and, again, certain you know other intellectual streams that, that fed into SS ideology. But, but Himmler believed that the master race that he was working back toward descended from, came from extraterrestrials, uh, you know, higher intelligences that were from another planet. Again, that's all theosophy and ariosophy. But, but Himmler's using that idea, again, to, to, again, argue for the supremacy of one line, and he wanted it to, to originate in the north. Uh, this is where you get Hyperborean mythology, and it's because of, again, theosophical, ariosophical literature, this occult literature. But Hit- Himmler believed it. He believed that, that those races, those great races, supermen races of antiquity, came from the gods, which he believed were off-planet, came from another planet. And that the, the master race he was trying to reproduce and, and uh, you know, take control of the world again were their descendants. So... There are, again, I'm not saying Hitler believed all this or all the Nazis believed this, but Himmler did. And, and there are certain parts of SS thinking and ritual that, again, um, are what they are because 
of what we would call today ancient astronaut belief. As we interview different scholars, they have shared with us that critical scholarship doesn't really make it to the masses. Is it the same in your religious community? Yeah, I, I think that is just across the board a problem. Um, you know, I, I, I'm willing to say, though, that, uh, that it's probably a bigger problem in the evangelical world and that's because in the evangelical tradition, and I'm going back now to the, the late 1800s, you know, turn of the 20th century, because of things like Darwin, there, there are other things, but that's, that's the big boogeyman for the evangelical community historically. There has been a, there, there's a thread of, that, that runs through the evangelical community of a deep suspicion of higher education and science and scholarship. You don't really have that so much in mainline denominations. Um, so I think that, that that's why I say I think this is an even bigger problem within the evangelical community uh, historically. Now, you're, you're going to, I mean, I, I can take you to evangelical churches now where they would be horrified to hear that. So that's why I say historically that's been the case. But I, I do think that that is a, that's a very real uh, issue and, and a very real historical trajectory that has made this problem of just scholarship, what, what scholars do, being so disconnected uh, from what the average person in the pew hears. And it, it just, it shouldn't be, you know, it, it really shouldn't be. Um, but it's a hard sell, you know, in, in many cases within the evangelical community because you're, 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 you're battling up this sort of um, entrenched resistance that has just sort of been passed on consciously or unconsciously uh, within the tradition. I know you have taught undergraduate level courses in Christian colleges uh, regarding the occult, paranormal, and esoteric beliefs. Can Christians study those topics without it having to lead to some type of missionary activity in relation to it? Can people talk about those subjects without having to integrate it into some type of outreach? Um, do you see that, or is that part of the anti-intellectualism that they won't get involved with those subjects unless it leads to trying to help people get connected with their faith? Or? First of all, there are very few, again, what we would broadly call evangelical Christians that are students of this sort of material, uh, whether it be occult material uh, or uh, sort of that wing of intellectual history or like new age uh, contemporary religions or new religious movements, you know, uh, UFOs, paranormal phenomena, all of it, you know, PSI, parapsychology. There are very few evangelicals that, that do any of it at all. I think, again, that there, I would, I would put it this way. There's probably a something of a propensity toward evangelicals getting involved in that for just the reason that you articulated, that I'm going to study this so that I can go witness to people who are in this and, and win them to Christ and whatnot. Um, and again, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing, but you, the, the question you asked me is, should that be the only reason you do it? My answer to that would be no. Um, it's, not, it's not the only reason I do it. I mean, in, in fact, the, the quote-unquote uh, missionary trajectory is actually uh, on the back burner for the reason I do it. I, I more or less do it because I'm I'm interested in these topics, and I want to know if there's any validity to them. Uh, we we've already produced one episode of a of a new podcast that will be I think it's it's actually online, but um, we're starting a new podcast called Peer a Normal, and what I want to do on that is. I want to introduce listeners to peer-reviewed scholarship on all these, anything that, that we would fit, would fit under the paranormal, parapsychological umbrella. Because a lot of people don't realize that there are serious scientists and serious scholars who actually have, you know, looked at these things in a lab under controlled, to do, uh, controlled conditions, uh, really trying to do good scholarship on all sorts of things. And it gets published. It gets published in academic journals under peer review. But most of what people who are interested in this stuff hear and see is 
again, the wild world of the Internet or the, or the Fantasy Channel, otherwise known as the History Channel. I mean, th- there's actually just better stuff on it. So I, I'm interested in it because I, I'm curious about it. I want to know if there's any validity to it. Uh, I, I do believe, you know, in, in a spiritual world, a spiritual realm. So one of my questions is, okay, telekinesis, for example, is that, you know, some sort of, of you know, psychic ability that, that is, is entirely human that uh, we can tap into because of some, you know, element of quantum physics that we don't quite understand? Or does that involve spirit beings? You know, again, I want to be able to answer a question like that because my suspicion is a lot of this stuff has nothing to do with demons or anything like that. Uh, if it's real, it's probably again something you know related to, you know, you know quantum connectedness. If I can use a, a layperson's term, or, you know, the whole question of consciousness and all that. So I I, I think that uh, Christians ought to be involved in that because it does take us into areas like what is the nature of consciousness. You know, what, what is the nature of, you know, the, how does it contribute to the whole mind-body material versus immaterial reality debate? And, and, and that's not doing demonology. That's not putting everything in the, into, the, into the demon tank, which I think is a, is a big mistake. So I, I think it's legitimate, you know, to get involved in it and to, to think about it for other reasons. In religious history, the philosophers such as Aristotle, Moses Maimonides, Aquinas, they had this idea of all truth is God's truth. Is that prevalent or does that exist in the Protestant community as well? It does. It's very common, especially in the Reformed community. Uh, Reformed uh, denominations like, you know, Presbyterians, you know, that that, that sort of thing, Christian Reformed Church, um, any, anybody who would sort of go under the Reformed umbrella. And that's because uh, I think, again, just generally speaking, Reformed Christianity, Christianity that grew out of the Reformation, the Luther, Calvin, Knox, those traditions, they, from the beginning, they were very tuned into um, not making a distinction between the secular and the sacred. And and if you if you follow that trajectory, you come out with, you know, notions like, well, all truth is God's truth. We, we should, Christians should go into the scientific fields because it's part of what, you know, part of the, the Adamic mandate, which is in theology called the dominion mandate or the cultural mandate, that we should, we should explore God's creation to find out what makes it tick, how, you know, to, to explore what it's doing the way it was, you know, made to function. You know, the science is, a, is not only a legitimate thing to do, but it's, it's a sacred thing to do because there is no difference between secular and sacred. It's all sacred. Uh, and so the reform community has been very, very much running along those trajectories. And, of course, Aquinas within the Catholic tradition uh, also would have as well. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of validity to it that we shouldn't uh, – we shouldn't have competing areas of truth. If something is true about the natural world and we believe that God created it, okay, then, then by definition, you know, we have to honor that. Otherwise, we have a competing creator, a bad creator. You know, like, why don't we just be Gnostics then and have the demiurge running around? You know, it, but, but Christians, again, because they have this deep suspicion in many Christian traditions of science, they do drive a wedge uh, between what we say about the natural world and the and the theological world, and it, they they try to they make them they make them competitors when they shouldn't be competitors, or they make them antagonistic when the, when they're really not antagonistic. I don't know if you follow my blog, but a couple of days ago, I I wrote a post called "Christians who believe that that the Earth is really flat can it get any dumber than this?" and that's produced. Almost 120 comments, and a lot of them are really angry. So you actually know some people who feel that way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, well, I mean, I do now. Um, I posted it because, you know, I've written some articles on Israelite cosmology, you know, that it's, uh, you know, consistent with any other ancient Near Eastern cosmology. You know, you get a round, flat earth, covered with a dome, the pillars of the earth, you know, 
pillars under the earth, you know, all, all this, all the, all the typical vocabulary and the imagery, you know, dotted throughout uh, the Bible. And, and, you know, my, my basic point is, you know, Hey, this, you know, if you're going to embrace inspiration, then, you know, it, God knew what he was getting when he went to somebody in the second millennium BC and prompted them to write something. You know that they they didn't have this scientific knowledge, so it's understandable then. But to but to believe in the flat Earth now, and and somehow say that, you know, this is what we're supposed to believe, you know, because of, of the Bible is just absurd. You know, and and uh, because of that, I've been getting emails and things on Facebook. Do you really believe in the flood? You know, and I've gotten enough of these that I, I don't know what was going on out there in Facebook land. But, uh, you know, I, I posted this and, uh, yeah, lots of people have, have, uh, been real angry about it, you know, and I, it's, it's depressing actually, but you know, what can you do? But do you see it as, uh, any publicity is good publicity? I see it as, any annoyance is a real annoyance. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but um, I, I can tell from um, your background and what I've read uh, about you online is that um, you're trying to uh, shed light on how scholarship is important um, when we're talking about important issues, especially dealing with the Bible. So um, I guess if, if a debate is started regarding that issue, then people will be more um, aware of how you can still have very strong held beliefs, but also integrate uh, academic and scholarship knowledge into the mix and, and still come out sane. Do you think that that can be true? Oh, I, I, it, it can certainly be true, but you know, thank you for trying to cheer me up there. <laughs> You know, for a lot of for a lot of these people, at least from the tone of the comments, I I just think that I mean, once once you've sort of given yourself over to dispensing with reason, and and I think this is the bigger problem, having such a deep distrust of science, the scientific community, uh, and and really really going off the deep end on the uh, the conspiratorial way of of viewing the world uh, that that you're sort of immune to, to appeals to reason. Um, it's probably a bit of an overstatement, but, you know, I don't know what you can, I mean, you, you can, you can tell people the truth and that's, that's just what we try to do and sort of leave it at that. But they, some of them just, just really get hysterical about it. I mean, I, I, I found it, you know, I, I I can't believe that that my background would be so different. But when I was in grad school, I mean, the the, the church I went to this was a serious church, you know. But it was dominated. I mean, dominated by people in the hard sciences. I mean, we had a dozen faculty members from the University of Wisconsin there, you know, and heads of departments, you know, all sorts of things. I mean, I, I was in the humanities and I felt alone, you know, it just. They, they were they were serious scholars and serious scientists. Probably a better way to put that, um, but also you know serious believers and and it, it was just a a really good thing to see. Um, you know, it, it just makes me laugh whenever whenever I hear people you know from the atheist community say something like, "Well, you, you can't be a real scientist and you know be a Christian or you know be believe in God." It's just a joke. I mean, you have to want to believe that. That is a belief statement right there. Uh, and it, it either shows that you're underexposed to reality or you're just willfully suppressing some point of reality that you just don't, you don't want to entertain. And, and I think the, the flat earth is sort of the, the flip side of that coin. Just somebody so given over, giving themselves to, to some position or idea that that you almost can't appeal to them. But, you know, with, with what I do, it's like, it's like, look, you know, to, to, to someone who criticizes the Bible o over science, I mean, it, it's like, wh why are you criticizing this thing, this book, for not saying, not being what it was never intended to be? That's just incoherent. So we can have a discussion if you can demonstrate to me that this approach you have makes any sense at all. 
I mean, that, that, that it isn't absurd. Because if you can't do that, I mean, that, that, that criticism sounds really dumb to my ear. It's uber-literalism. It's this myth of, you know, we can't assign importance to the Bible unless we, we approach everything with just some cartoonish literalism. Thank you so much for your time. All right, sure. Thank you. Show descriptions and content are available online on our Facebook page and on SoundCloud.com. We would like to thank the Independent Media Club at the farm for their continued support and Radio Free Nashville for their technical guidance and assistance. Go 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 guidance and assistance.